So thanks everyone for, for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's, I'm very excited to have uh, today's speaker. Uh, Dr. John Jackson is an assistant professor uh, in the departments of epidemiology, biostatistics, and mental health uh, at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's also a core faculty in the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, Center for Health Disparity Solutions, and Center for Drug Safety and Effectiveness. Um, his research primarily focuses on developing methodological tools for translational health equity research. Um, and today he's going to talk about uh, some of these methods um, and with current applications in healthcare and uh, clinical prognosis as well. His work has been funded by a K01 award from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, as well as with pilot funding from uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, so we've been having um, a series, uh, the Innovation and Methods series of lectures this year has really been focusing on researchers um, uh, as well as clinicians who study um, uh, structural factors, uh, including uh, discrimination and inequities um, and historical factors as well that affect uh, health outcomes. Um, our previous lectures have focused a lot on, on on the history and the impact of that of the history in different populations, and so today we'll have uh, someone, uh, an epidemiologist, who really applies uh, from a very epidemiologic perspective um, these these concepts uh, into analytical uh, in this analytical method. So please welcome Dr. Jackson. Thank you, um, sir. I'm uh, uh, very so uh, so much, Dr. Ahmad Khan, um, for uh, having me here today to, to talk about this work. Um, today's talk, I really want to focus on um, how we incorporate equity value judgments into both measuring disparities and uh, using what I call decomposition analysis to try to understand which uh, factors contribute to disparities. Um, this is something that I call causal decomposition analysis, uh, but uh, many people attempt to do sort of this sort of work through some form of uh, mediation analysis or um, something else. And, and sometimes even in the literature, you'll see analyses where people make adjustments for things um, in an explanatory sense um, to try to gauge which factors are contributing to disparities. And so I'm trying to package all of these ideas about fairness and equity and causal inference uh, into sort of one package um, in, in, in a meaningful uh, way. So that's sort of the spirit of the analysis. I'm sure you've all seen clinical studies where people are studying racial and ethnic disparities and outcomes and, and trying to understand what's, what's contributing to those factors. Uh, so I'm gonna open up with a motivating example to help really ground ideas. Um, and then I'm gonna sort of step back and talk about uh, ethical issues or equity value judgments and how we define disparities. Um, and I'm going to do so for both um, health outcomes, but also um, targets that we might be uh, thinking about that we could uh, intervene on to change those outcomes. And then I'm going to talk about these ideas about how we define disparities in outcomes and targets for estimation and causal decomposition analysis, which again is, you know, a way to try to understand which factors might be uh, um, good targets for reducing disparities. Uh, and then I'll sort of try to tie some of these ideas to um, existing estimators and talk about the weakness of those estimators. Um, and these are estimators that you might be more familiar with. Uh, for further reading, um, you can see a paper by myself and uh, Tyler Vanderwill, which was published in 2018. Um, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's published in the journal Epidemiology. I also have a commentary that year in, in Epidemiology, but most of what I'm going to be talking about today is a paper that was published in March uh, in, in epidemiology. Uh, and this admittedly is a really technical paper. So um, I just want to put that out there. But in the middle of the paper, I talk about a lot of the uh, equity value judgments that I'll be talking about today. Uh, there's no formulae in, in that section. Um, it's, it's entirely pro. So if, if, if this is of interest to, uh, to you, I would encourage you to um, check this paper out. Um, and in and, and future work, I'm hoping to, to have more um, um, applied examples for, for those who are interested in applying these methods. So at least in, in the US context, 
at least since the 1990s, um, we've been thinking about disparities, racial and ethnic disparities uh, in, in light of our public health priorities. Uh, so there's this uh, report called the Healthy People Report, which is um, put out by the Department of Health and uh, Human Services. Uh, and, 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 the port, and the report sort of uses uh, popula population health metrics, um, setting targets on those metrics, uh, that 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 we would like to achieve uh, during um, a given decade, and so in 2000, some of the goals that really drove which metrics were chosen were um, goals about reducing health disparities, eliminating health disparities, um, and then eventually um, achieving health equity and eliminating disparities. So it's evolved over time, but it's the same spirit. And uh, when we think about how we've been doing over the past, say, 20 years. Um, at least in, in the U.S. context, I can say that disparities remain in many areas when we think about cancer incidence and mortality, when we think about post-surgical outcomes, and uh, most recently uh, the, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, when we look at infection, hospitalization, and mortality. One, one area that is really striking to me is the area of subclinical risk. Um, and so I'm showing you data about hypertension prevalence um, and awareness and um, treatment and control in the next slide um, in, in the United States. Um, and, and, and these are um, uh, data that come from uh, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a national probability survey, which is nationally represented um, um, of, of adults in the US. Um, and so these data are looking at uh, adults uh, age 64 and Above and so on the left, we are, we're showing prevalence for um, blacks, which is um, in the green line, uh, um, um, whites in the blue line, and Hispanics in 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 the yellow line. Um, and so what we see here is that you know even over the over the last twenty years, there's been a twenty percent gap in uh, prevalence over the last twenty years, and so we've really made no progress in. Our, in in reducing the, uh, the excess prevalence for uh, non-Hispanic blacks versus non-Hispanic whites. Uh, we, we, if you look at awareness on, on the right, we, we, we can see that encouragingly we have closed some of the gaps. Uh, but when we look at um, treatment, um, again, we see that we've closed some of the gaps. But when we look at uh, hypertension control for those who have been treated, we see uh, the, the, the stark reality that even though we've been able to improve uh, the, the proportion of those who are able to control their hypertension for um, every racial ethnic group, we see that uh, gaps have persisted. So for example, uh, when we look at, um, at non-Hispanic Blacks versus non-Hispanic Whites, there's been a 10% difference um, that, has been, uh, that has persisted um, over at least the last 20 years. And so the gap hasn't changed. And, and to me, this is um, really striking because hypertension is an area where uh, we uh, where we understand the epidemiology. Uh, we we understand what the major risk factors are, and we have several tools in our arsenal um, to um, to address it. So the American Heart Association has um, listed out several non pharmacological interventions. Uh, that have meaningful effects on lowering blood pressure, uh, from uh, um, from losing weight to um, eating a healthy diet uh, to uh, being physically active, moderating alcohol intake. Um, and the American College of Cardiology has um, really detailed pharmacotherapy uh, clinical guidelines um, about um, medications that have been established in uh, rigorous randomized trials that show um, again, clinically meaningful um, effects on, 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 on lowering blood pressure. So we have several tools um, at our disposal, and yet you know, these, 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 these gaps in both prevalence and also in hypertension control, they, they remain. It's also striking because there's at least some evidence um, that you know, we're able to make progress. Uh, so these are data from Kaiser Permanente, which is a, a large um, integrated healthcare system in the United States, um, spanning several states, 
and um, these are data uh, from the from from the California system, which is one of their 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 their, their largest care areas, and and this data shows the control rate uh, for um, uh, whites, which is the line on top, and uh, blacks, which is the line on the bottom, and and you can see that over the course of from 2009 to 2014, they were able to cut the 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 disparity in, 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 in hypertension control by half. So going from about 8% to about 4%. And they did so using team-oriented care, uh, trust building activities, uh, community education, also provider education. So there is some um, uh, evidence that, you know, not only do we have tools at our disposal, but we are able to reorganize care uh, to eliminate or, or reduce disparities in hypertension control. And so this is, you know, really the, the motivating example that I'd like to use uh, for this talk to talk about ethical value judgments and causal decomposition analysis. Um, and so I work at, uh, Johns, uh, at, at Johns Hopkins. And so one question I might ask is, you know, observing racial differences and hypertension control in, in, in our healthcare system, what policies and interventions could we do to reduce disparities? And, and really causal decomposition analysis is, 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 is a way to sort of answer that question. So to do this, um, we, we, we might envision an, an uh, observational study where we, re, where we enroll patients at the date of, uh, of a particular primary care visit. Uh, and we might you know, decide that you know, we're gonna enroll people who have a, a prevalent diagnosis of, of hypertension. Um, and then we might, a measure, say, as a, as a potential target for intervention, we, we, we might be wondering, you know, is implicit bias, you know, at the point of clinical decision making something that, you know, um, contributes to disparities in um, treatment decisions around antihypertensive medications? Um, is that a potential ex explanation for these disparities in hypertension control? Um, so, and so to examine that hypothesis, we might measure treatment intensification, whether or not a provider um, uh, either either initiated or perhaps changed the class or changed the dose of, of an antihypertensive medication. We might measure that in the two weeks after the PCP visit, and we might measure the outcome about six months later, which you know we might um, um, be we might be measuring their systolic and diastolic blood pressure either directly or 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 through. Um, the medical record. And so at the point of the uh, encounter, going back, say, six months, we also might collect data on demographics such as age and sex, socioeconomic status, such as, say, um, the, what, what type of insurance they have or, or their educational attainment. We also might have measures of clinical status, um, such as co, um, comorbid conditions, such as diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and also their a baseline of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Now, if we uh, want to represent, you know, these variables on a causal graph, um, because we, you know, eventually we, we, we want to do some causal inference, so it can be helpful to think about how these things are related. Um, why is uh, what I'm calling hypertension control, and you can see that it's it's essentially affected um, by by everything. M is treatment intensification, so whether or not the the provider decided to, 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 to change some aspect of treatment. Uh, and then we have our uh, covariates, demographics, so socioeconomic factors, and, and, and uh, clinical factors. And I just want to point out what some of these um, arrows uh, might, uh, might mean. So I usually think of um, arrows coming out of uh, uh, this variable here, which signifies uh, race. Uh, um, and so arrows out of this, that are leading to some factor. So this is sort of a decision node, uh, a decision about treatment intensification. I see that as sort of, um, if you look in the causal inference literature, you can think of this as a form of discrimination or uh, differential treatment. And um, that may be um, implicit um, when providers, um, you know, on the basis of the clinical relationship, if they know less about their patients, they may rely more on stereotypes that um, are associated with their patient. And so sometimes implicit and bias can arise through those mechanisms. Um, arrows that go directly from race to outcomes, um, I sort of see that as propagations of, 
uh, decisions along the way. So this may involve some other, you know, um, the decision outside of um, maybe that, you know, that might be related to employment or housing that might go on to ultimately affect um, blood pressure. Um, but race can be associated with outcomes in other ways. Uh, so for example, um, we know that, you know, and, and DAGs aren't really great at, at, at depicting this, but, you know, race can also be associated with early life conditions. So, you know, um, if you know that um, someone who's been assigned a particular race, because um, in my view, I, I view race as, as a socially constructed variable, um, but, but because of the historical realities of structural racism in the United States, um, the, 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 the parents and, 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 and ancestors uh, had, had, had uh, differential opportunities to say build wealth, right? And so when someone's born, they are automatically more likely to sort of be in a certain so socioeconomic bracket. And that has nothing to do um, necessarily with present day dis discrimination, at least in, 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 in uh, early, early life. I mean, perhaps in adulthood, it could pick up those effects, which is what this arrow represents. But it also, I'm saying that there's some correlation with um, you know, what's happened to their parents and their ancestors. We also know that there's been um, which is really fascinating, um, differences in fertility rates over time. Um, and that can lead to differential age distributions, right? Um, when, and so you can have correlations between race and say age. And so in the U.S. context, you can see that actually, um, um, uh, the black population is actually uh, a couple years younger on average than, than the white population. And you can see this reflected in, in clinical samples too. Um, and so, you know, you have, you know, associations between race because of, say, effects of discrimination, but also because of structural disadvantage, which is largely driven by historical factors. Um, and so, you know, given, given, given these data, you know, we want to know what contributes to disparities through treatment intensification. Uh, decisions uh, contribute to disparities. Would they serve as, as a good target for intervention? And so we can do a causal decomposition analysis. And, and causal decomposition analysis essentially asks a what if question. Uh, and so the way I see it is that, you know, we observe uh, um, hypertension control rates for say the black population and say we observe hypertension control rates for the, for the white population. Causal decomposition analysis poses a counterfactual. It says, what if we took the black population, um, kept everything about them the same, but then, you know, intervened to remove disparities in treatment intensification. So we intensified their treatment at the same rate that whites had their treatment intensification. Um, and what, what would the average outcomes um, in, 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 in hypertension control uh, be for, 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 for the black population in this scenario? And so that leads us to uh, three estimates. One is our observed disparity where we contrast uh, hypertension control rates for um, that are observed between blacks and whites and then we get into these counterfactual quantities where we have the, the reduced disparity which compares hypertension control rates um, that are observed among blacks versus uh, the counterfactual uh, rates where where we remove disparities in treatment intensification and then we have this residual disparity which says uh, we have the hypertension control rate for uh, blacks under this counterfactual scenario where we remove disparities in treatment intensification versus the observed hypertension control rate for whites. So again, we have this observed disparity, how much it would reduce if we um, eliminated disparities in, in treatment intensification, and then how much of a disparity would remain um, after we reduce disparities in treatment intensification. So all of this is well and good, but if we step back, um, it became you know, clear to me at least that we have to first ask well, what does the racial difference in outcomes mean? How do we measure disparity? Uh, and so oftentimes in, in, in the epidemiology uh, literature and sometimes in the clinical literature, you'll see that oftentimes a, a, a crude a difference across racial groups is considered to be synonymous with disparity. But when you look at some of the bioethics literature, it becomes more clear uh, that they um, don't necessarily make that assumption. So one definition that I've rely on a lot is one that was put forth by uh, Paula Braveman and colleagues 
which was used in um, the Department of Health and Human Services um, a Healthy People 2020 report. And that definition was actually built off of uh, Margaret Whitehead, um, her definition, which was used in uh, her work at the World Health Organization uh, in the 90s. And so that definition largely says that a disparity in health is, um, uh, um, is, is a difference that is uh, systematic, um, avoidable, and one that adversely affects uh, socially disadvantaged groups. Um, and it's a great paper. And one of the really, one of the nuggets in that paper um, says that, you know, when you're looking at these disparities, um, they, they may reflect social disadvantage. So they may re reflect the, the fact that, you know, the marginalized group, um, Blacks in the U.S. context, are, um, are, are more disadvantaged than, than, than the privileged group. So, you know, whites in the US context, but you don't have to demonstrate that there's a, a causal effect of, of, of a disadvantage to think of these things as unfair and unjust. Um, and so this definition is really founded on the principle of human rights, um, that, you know, health is, 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 is a basic good that, 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 that everyone needs to achieve um, a good life and, and and so if you are disadvantaged on health um uh um you know th that's 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 not a good thing and, and it's enough to say that you know we have a group that's been historically marginalized and now they're further disadvantaged on health um and health is something that's needed to achieve say um uh um you know to obtain goods in society to work to actually live out a good life and so um you know, this definition doesn't, isn't really uh, predicated on the notion of there being a cause. It's just saying that, you know, we have a, a group that's disadvantaged and, and we don't want them to be further disadvantaged on health. Um, and I think you can make a, a, at least a moral argument that, you know, this descriptive measure of, of disparity has a meaning. There's another uh, definition that shows up in the health services research literature uh, that is also quite popular, um, particularly um, when you're thinking about uh, disparities in uh, health care. Um, and so um, this, this definition came, is, you know, came from what was known as the Institute of Medicine, which is now known as the National Academy, as the National Academies of Medicine. And, uh, and this, this definition, if you're really interested, um, you can go back to the, to the unequal treatment report which was published in 2002, uh, which was a really seminal paper. And so that, that, um, that, that, that publication defined disparities in healthcare as differences that are uh, not due to differences in access to care, uh, clinical needs, or preferences for care. Uh, and I put asterisks by access to care and preferences for care because those are debatable depending on the situation, but almost no one um, debates um, the fact that you know healthcare should be delivered according to clinical uh, need. So, um, what these definitions have in common is this notion of allowability, um, and and I'm using outcome allowed, an outcome allowability here because I'm, I'm I'm talking about how we would think about measuring disparities in hypertension control, um, you know, in our particular thought experiment. And so we might say that, you know, allowable sources of difference might be ones that we consider to be fair, uh, that do not contribute to unjust difference, um, and ones that we might adjust for um, um, to, to take their contribution off the table when we measure disparity. Uh, whereas non-allowable sources might be things that we might consider to be unfair sources of difference that uh, do contribute to unjust difference that we wouldn't want to adjust for because we uh, want to keep their contributions on the table when when we measure disparity. Uh, and so um, in our example, again, as I was saying, race may be associated with hypertension control in uh, many ways. Uh, we know that um, in, in clinical samples, um, Blacks are often uh, times younger and have a higher proportion of females, uh, which can predict better hypertension control, and then race um, can be you know, positively correlated with low SCS, uh, and, 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 and also a higher prevalence of comorbid conditions, both of which can predict worse hypertension control. And so the question is, which of these differences should be captured in our disparity uh, measure? 
so again, the, 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 the bioethics and uh, moral philosophy literature actually offers some principles. Um, and two that I found that kept popping up again and again are these two principles of, of, of manipulability and amenability to intervention. So manipulability essentially says that factors that quote unquote responsible actor um, has no control over are factors that might be considered to be allowable, um, i.e. things that would be adjusted for when measuring disparity. Uh, whereas um, a counter principle is amenability to intervention, which says that non-manipulable non non factors that have addressable effects uh, might be considered non-allowable, especially if they affect a socially uh, marginalized uh, group. So for example, a, a manipulable factor. Um, so, so if one were thinking purely about manipulability, sometimes, you know, if there are differences in say pre-existing um, alleles that are shown to be high risk variants, you know, for the outcomes, people might adjust those away. Or, um, or if we're thinking about amenability to inter intervention, it really says, well, you know, if this is something that's causing you know, excess uh, risk among the marginalized group, and we have a way to actually do something about it, whether or not, you know, we can change the factor, but maybe we can address the effects, then, you know, we might consider that as a contributor to disparity if, say, you know, we haven't developed an intervention um, to address those effects, or if those interventions are distributed um, unevenly. And so, the example for our analysis, um, we might think about, um, demographics, should we treat those as allowable? So we know that age predicts uh, usually, um, older age usually predicts worse hypertension control. Um, and even though it's not manipulable, um, it does have um, arguably addressable effects, like you know, we may make um, some of our care age appropriate. But in the US context, we know that blacks are um, often younger than whites in clinical context. And so you know, when we see excess rates for hypertension control among Blacks, it can't be because they're um, older, because they're actually younger. Um, and so um, in this case, uh, we might actually consider them to be allowable, um, age differences to be allowable and adjust for them. Um, and one important reason why this is the case is, um, you know, if you don't do that in this particular setting, you actually might um, mask disparity. Um, and you can see that in the, um, some of the COVID-19 data actually where the age effects are strong. Uh, in the Open Safely study, which is a, um, an, a large ER, um, uh, ER study uh, done in, in, in the UK, uh, when they looked at ethnic differences in mortality, the, 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 the ratio was actually null. But once you just adjusted for age and sex, it was a twofold uh, ratio. Um, so, so, so sometimes these, these things can be really profound. Um, so what about comorbidity? Well, we know that, you know, having comorbidities um, and perhaps having a, a higher blood pressure at baseline might predict, um, a, a, you know, a lower ability to uh, control blood pressure. Um, and, you know, um, at, at, you know, at the point of care, we can't really magically wave a wand and, and erase the fact that someone has comorbidities. Um, and, and again, you know, but in this case, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Blacks are usually have um, higher prevalence of comorbidities. Um, and, and also more importantly, comorbidities have addressable effects, um, you know, through medical care. So in this case, we could think about treating comorbidities as non-allowable as things that do contribute to disparity. Because again, um, you know, they, 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 Blacks are disadvantaged on these factors um, that, that lead to worse outcomes. And, and we also, hypothetically speaking, have, have, have ways to do something about this. Um, and then for um, socioeconomic status, um, you know, the, the reasoning sort of um, is very similar to co comorbid factors in some sense. Um, low SES predicts uh, worse health outcomes. Um, you know, and again, it may not be manipulable at, at the point of care. You can't really change someone's, um, ed, you know, ed, educational attainment or their occupation, uh, but it's, it is becoming increasingly um, accepted in, in medicine that, you know, we may be able to respond to people's social needs, either through um, having some sort of um, 
interaction with the social worker or, 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 or addressing some in, in some way um, interventions that um, speak to the social determinants of health. And so there are things that we can do to um, address the fact that, you know, Blacks are um, overrepresented among those um, in, in, in those socioeconomic strata and these things have impacts on health. And so in this case, again, we could think about this as uh, factors that are non-allowable that we wouldn't want to adjust for so that SES differences across race do contribute to um, disparities in hypertension control. Um, and so the last thing, um, you know, there's always a, a, there's always a counter principle. Um, and so one thing that's pretty fascinating is, you know, um, there are different ways of using disparity um, in any analysis. And so, you know, if you're thinking a, a, in a purist sense from as an epidemiologist, sort of documenting what's going on and trying to um, understand what might, um, you know, where we could intervene uh, to reduce disparity um, is, is, is one goal, but sometimes disparity measures might be used in other ways in society, say, for example, to set performance incentives. So, you know, um, it, 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 you know, and so one thing that I'm saying here, the, the bottom line is that when you're thinking about allowability, you have to think about the purpose, right? So if we were using disparity measures, um, not necessarily in an empirical sense, but in, in sort of a, um, in a benchmarking sense, where we were saying, um, you know, rating different clinics or different healthcare systems uh, by the disparity that they have and sort of setting incentives that, you know, would penalize institutions with large disparities. Um, in that case, you actually might want to risk adjust for comorbidities um, so, um, so that, you know, clinics aren't incentivized to avoid complex patients. Um, because it, 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 in that case, you know, complex patients oftentimes be, um, they come from marginalized groups because, you know, they, um, they, they may have more comorbidities. And so um, the, the institutions that take those patients are necessarily going to have larger disparities, may have a harder time reducing those disparities. And so to account for that, you actually might want to adjust for those factors. And so what I'm saying here is that, you know, your decisions around allowability, you know, you have to think about how is this measure being used um, in practice in society? Is it, is it being used for empirical purposes or is it really being used for some, some sort of um, or, um, metric to change organizational behavior. Um, and so however, you know, we um, choose to uh, um, designate what's allowable versus not, I'm, I'm proposing a really simple measure of disparity. Um, it's, a, it's really just a descriptive uh, measure. Um, it is um, not the uh, causal effect of manipulating someone's race. It's just comparing people across race groups. It's also not the causal effect of um, balancing the allowable distribution. So I'm not proposing an intervention that goes in and forces the distribution to be um, balanced across groups. Really, it's just saying, you know, we're gonna decide what's gonna be allowable and then simply standardize um, uh, um, the, the, the disparity measure according to a common distribution of those allowables. And, I, and the reason why I, I really like a descriptive measure for disparity is because uh, it's probably the most feasible thing you can do. Uh, and, and you know, what at least we saw in the US context in disparity is that feasibility matters when we're measuring disparity. Um, you know, in areas where we weren't reporting race um, or didn't have adequate data, we couldn't really measure disparity, so we had to get creative. But the, the point here is that if we made, you know, um, disparity, which to me is sort of like a workhorse or a signal of social justice issues, if we make it something that really needs elaborate causal assumptions to identify and estimate it, we actually might hold back social justice because in, in most settings in clinical medicine, I don't know if we necessarily have adequate data to sort of um, always estimate causal effects of, um, intervening on several non-allowables and, and also that trying to attempting to estimate an effect of race would be extremely difficult, um, which is beyond the topic of this talk, but I'm happy to talk about it in the question in, in, in the Q&A sessions. So again, I think it really should be motivated, uh, you know, for a descriptive uh, measure of disparity. Um, 
Um, so again, if we go back to our thought experiment, uh, we see that we have, you know, um, you know, we're, we're really thinking about, okay, what happens if we, if we remove disparities in uh, treatment intensification? What would happen to the disparity in, 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 in hypertension control? Um, and so when, 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 when we think uh, more deeply about that, um, you know, and we recognize that our intervention is to remove disparities in a, in, in, in a potential target, we have to ask ourselves, okay, how do we define disparity in that target? Um, essentially, which in this example is asking, how do we measure disparities in treatment decisions? Um, and so again, so here are some guidance uh, comes from the health services research literature, namely the IOM report. Um, and, and like in uh, the public health literature, it doesn't equate uh, uh, racial difference with disparity. Uh, again, they um, define disparities as uh, differences that are not due to uh, clinical needs and, and possibly differences to access to care preferences for care. Um, but essentially, you know, there's this notion of allowability again. And, and I'm phrasing this as target allowability because now we're thinking about disparities in our intervention, um, you know, in our, in our intervention target, you know, that, that our intervention wants to, uh, to remove. And so again, allowable sources are, are, are differences that we might consider to be fair, that uh, do not contribute to unjust difference or disparity that we would wanna adjust for to take their contribution off the table. Whereas non-allowable sources of difference might be those we consider to be unfair um, that uh, do contribute to unjust difference uh, that we would not want to directly adjust for to keep their uh, contribution on the table. And so when we think about, again, treatment uh, disparities, um, you know, we can see that race can be associated with treatment in many ways, either um, because again, uh, blacks are younger, often younger and have a higher proportion of, 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 of um, females and, or, or, or males. And then um, uh, there are also differences in socioeconomic status and also clinical factors that also determine treatment, right? So um, the question again is which of these differences uh, through demographics or socioeconomic status or through clinical factors should be treated as target, target allowable, which what, i.e. what should we adjust for when we're thinking about disparities in, um, in our in our intervention target. And so for this, um, you know, looking at the island definition, but also thinking more broadly about how uh, discrimination has been defined in say labor economics, uh, what I realized is that there's, it seems to me that there's this general principle that, uh, um, you know, that society has some sort of contract um, that says that, you know, there's criteria that we could possibly all agree should ideally govern how a good is distributed. Um, and, and, it's, and it's ideal because it may be something that, you know, in practice, we, we don't always achieve. Um, but, but essentially, it's something that, you know, we could agree to, even if we don't all necessarily agree. Um, but there's some sort of notion uh, that there are some criteria that, that's, that sort of guide how we would like goods in society to be distributed. And so, you know, when we think about this principle in terms of our covariates, well, you know, if we were thinking about age and sex, um, the clinical guidelines that I mentioned earlier by the um, American College of Cardiology definitely um, stratify their treatment pathways on, on, on um, age and sex because they can modify treatment. And also, um, um, you know, when we think about um, clinical factors, you know, um, again, uh, you know, medical ethics um, dictates that clinical decisions be uh, uh, clinically appropriate. Uh, so it makes sense that, you know, uh, comorbidities, um, baseline blood pressure are really uh, should, could, could, could be treated as, as, um, as part of that social contract, um, part of the criteria that should distribute uh, treatment, um, treat, treatment decisions. Um, and so what about social economic status? Um, this is a really interesting one because the clinical guidelines uh, don't recommend making decisions based on one's educational attainment or on one's um, uh, income or occupation, at least with respect to, uh, you know, pharmacotherapy decisions around 
antihypertensive medications. Um, and so I would argue that it should be treated as non-allowable um, on the basis of you know, clinical guidelines. Uh, even though it's true in the US, um, I don't have a lot of detail about you know, the, the Canadian system, but in the US, um, you know, we have a really fragmented system. Um, and so whether or not you have health insurance, what type of health insurance can really determine what, what uh, type of access you have to certain medications. And so at least where I live, um, our contract actually includes SES implicitly. Um, but I would say for the purposes of the analysis, um, based on my values, my value judgments, I would treat socioeconomic status as uh, non-allowable um, because I think the ideal contracts that you know, are reflected in the clinical guidelines really don't, don't include socioeconomic status. Um, and so this is a really interesting piece here is that you know, these social contracts that I'm thinking about here that I'm envisioning um, may vary from context to context and may actually evolve over time as we know more. But I think being explicit about what one thinks of as fair and how things are distributed um, really points out, you know, what should be used to define disparity in treatment. Uh, and so, again, there's always um, some uh, subtlety here is that, you know, when you have these contracts, there may actually be disparity in the criteria themselves, right? So if we were thinking about a situation where everyone needed treatment, but we still had to come up with some rule for allocating treatment, um, say, um, you know, when we're thinking about um, decisions to lift someone for uh, organ transplant, right? We have to have, so have a line and decide who gets in, in the line first. And so if we have some criteria that, that might make sense, say about, um, you know, if, if someone has, uh, a donor, or we may have, you know, um, how how ill they are, or it, or how, um, you know, how much social support they, they they have. You know, there may be criteria that you know that we could reasonably say that yeah, you know, these are the things that should should guide whether or not someone gets listed. But then there may be disparities in in these criteria themselves. And so, you know, if we're thinking about disparities at you know this larger level of like you know how listing decisions are allocated at the societal level, you know, we may actually want to treat these criteria as not allowable. And, and I would argue that you would want to do that in the case if you were trying to study the effects of say policies or interventions that were going to shift the distributions of those criteria, right? So we can think about this on a much broader sense and think about, you know, how can we um, make things uh, fair um, at, a, at a broader level. Uh, so again, you know, um, you know, we can think about, um, you know, a formal, a formal uh, descriptive measure here. And so in this causal de decomposition analysis, it, actually, so what's happening is that we're removing, we're removing racial differences in treatment intensification, not overall, but within levels of variables that are target allowable. Um, and, and, and so by, uh, um, you know, and that's, um, you know, both AY and AM, AYs are outcome allowables, AM are um, things that are exclusively target allowable, but together they're both what I call um, target allowable. So we're really just shifting, um, you know, we're, 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 we're removing disparities in treatment intensification among those who have the same values of target allowable. So for example, someone who has the same uh, values of age and sex and say clinical factors, we're, we're removing disparities um, and treatment intensification for people who have um, who are similarly similarly situated on on these variables, and so that you know now we can describe the estimate. How much would hypertension control disparity change if the treatment intensification disparity was removed? Um, and so you can see here that you know, and, and we also have um, you know our our, our alternate um, residual disparity of how much disparity would remain in hypertension control if we remove the disparity in treatment intensification. And so what's, what's nice here is that you can see that um, the estimate that, you know, the thing that we want to estimate, the scientific question we're asking is really about an observed disparity, uh, reduced disparity, and a residual disparity. And, and in each case, those disparities are only defined in things that are outcome allowable. Um, so for example, say um, age and sex demographics, things that I had argued should really be used to define disparities in hypertension control. Now the hypothetical intervention, you know, where we have um, blacks under 
um, the scenario where we've removed disparities in treatment intensification. Well, that's based on our, our intervention here, which only removes disparities within levels of variables that are target allowable, which includes the outcome allowables, uh, which includes age and sex, but also clinical factors. And so what I'm pointing out here is that, you know, non-allowables, um, at least the things that I've argued that should be non-allowable in both um, defining disparities in outcomes and also um, defining disparities in our targets are things that really don't enter our scientific question at all, right? So our disparity in hypertension control is not adjusting for socioeconomic status. And our intervention is also irrespective of socioeconomic status. And so the next question is, well, how does SES enter into the analysis? Um, and, and, and it enters in because it's a confounder, right? So we have to tie this hypothetical estimate to actual data. Um, and it, you can, if you look at the paper, there are some um, assumptions that, you know, we can make, um, some support, common support assumptions, some unconfounded assumptions, and some overlap assumptions that we can use to tie these to data. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but essentially with outcome allowables, we need to balance the distribution across race, so we need overlap. Um, we also need to be able to shift the distribution of treatment intensification uh, for Blacks to that of whites, so there needs to be a form of overlap there. Um, and then really the where SES is that we need to be able to identify um, um, the effect of um, shifting treatment intensification. Um, we need to identify um, that effect on, on hypertension control, which means that we need to control not just for the the, the allowables and, and race, but also um, socioeconomic status because it's a confounder of treatment intensification and hypertension control, right? So it's not a confounder of race and hypertension control. It's a confounder of treatment intensification and, and hypertension control. And it turns out um, that, you know, um, you can actually incorporate these non-allowables, excuse me, like socioeconomic status in, into the analysis without changing the scientific question that you're asking without changing how disparities are defined. Uh, we also need some technical assumptions like positivity and also consistency, uh, which I'm in interest in time, I'm gonna um, just skip through those. And so um, one really intuitive way we could carry out this causal decomposition analysis is just to do a series of weighted averages. So to get the observed disparity, we simply could use standard inverse probability weights um, where, where we're predicting the probability of belonging to a particular social group. And these weights really adjust for only the outcome allowable. So these, these weights would only adjust for say age and sex. And so for blacks, we have the probability of uh, the marginal probability of belonging to the black group divided by the conditional probability of belonging to the black group given a say age and sex. And we have a similar, um, uh, a, a similar weight uh, for, for whites. So this is the marginal probability of belonging to the white group. This is the, the conditional probability of belonging to the white groups given um, their age and sex. And so if we, and, and we can estimate those through a simple logistic regression. And so if we took a series of, of you know, um, you know, if we took a, a weighted uh, difference in hypertension control across race using these weights, that would give us the observed disparity uh, where we're balancing um, age and sex across race groups. Um, and so to get the reduced disparity um, where we're shifting the, the distribution of treatment intensification, uh, we, can, um, we can multiply that stabilized inverse probability rate for, 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 uh, for Blacks by, 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 by another factor. So this is simply um, one's Probability. So, for every black person, we 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 estimate two probabilities. In the numerator, is the probability of, of their observed treatment intensification. So, for people who were not intensified, this is the probability of not being intensified. Um, given uh, if we um, flip their race to white momentar momentarily, um, and then conditional on the the. the the, the target and the outcome allowable. So say conditional clinical factors um, and, and, and also demographics. And then in the numerator, it's a similar probability except the distribution is fit among blacks. Um, and then we also include socioeconomic status. 
So this is a probability of, 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 of observing um, their observed treatment intensification status um, given you know, um, their observed race, um, socioeconomic status, and say clinical factors and age and sex. And we multiply that by the stabilized inverse probability weight. So that gives us um, this, 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 this second weight. And so if we take a contrast of um, Blacks first where we weight according to that stabilized inverse probability weight that I just described where we're only adjusting for age and sex. And then we take a weighted average um, with this more elaborate weight that balances not only age and sex, but shifts the distribution of treatment intensification. That gives us the reduced disparity because we're comparing again, blacks under the observed scenario versus under this counterfactual scenario. And then um, we can do a similar analysis. Oh, and, and, and we can estimate this, um, you know, this weight again through, um, you know, uh, we can estimate the numerator from say a model and we can estimate the denominator from, from the model. And we can do um, a similar game to get the residual disparity where we um, take that more elaborate weight, get a weighted average for blacks, and then we get a weighted average for whites using that really that, that simpler inverse probability weight. Um, and so both you know, weights again balance the, the outcome allowables, but for blacks, what's happening is their distribution of treatment intensification is being shifted um, in such a way that you know, um, it is, uh, we're, we're, we're shifting uh, to um, within levels of these uh, outcome and in, in, in target allowables and, and making treatment intensification such that it doesn't depend on uh, socioeconomic status for non-allowable. And we can use bootstrapping to get confidence intervals. And so um, there may be other approaches out there that you may have used or may have heard of. Um, and, and these have some, some, some limitations. So there's the natural indirect effect there's a path specific effect and there's also the Oaxaca blinder decomposition analysis. The first two are estimators that come from the field of epidemiology and biostatistics. Uh, the Oaxaca blinder decomposition has come from the field of economics. Um, and, and um, you know, we can phrase decomposition estimates, de causal decomposition and out, um, estimates in terms of these estimators, but I argue that they have um, some problems when, when we think about how we define disparities. And the problem is, is that, you know, each of these would have to adjust for confounders. And the problem is, is how they adjust for confounders. So for example, your natural indirect effect um, estimators would, would treat um, every covariate that you need to control for confounding as both outcome allowable and target allowable. So the disparity in hypertension control is among those who have the same age and sex, same socioeconomic status, the same clinical factors, but as I argued before, um, you know, this would violate the principle of amenability to intervention. When we think about, you know, disparities in hypertension control and also social contract when we think about disparities and in treatment intensification, because treatment decisions really shouldn't be based on socioeconomic status. Uh, when we think about path specific effect estimators, um, nicely they would, you know, treat. Um, um, they would measure disparities only conditioning on age and sex, but you know the the, the intervention to shift treatment intensification would actually ignore um, not only socioeconomic status, but it would also ignore clinical factors. And so that would be really weird to go to the doctor and them not really take into account you know your your clinical profile to make a treatment decision. So that's really a meaningless um, estimate for this context. Um, and then, you know, there's another uh, uh, path-specific estimator that would condition the intervention on socioeconomic status. And as I argued before, that's not really what we want to do. And then with the Oaxaca blinder decomposition analysis, there's some really elegant analytic techniques out there. When we look at reweighting functions, um, these are like really popular in economics. Um, but to get to them and apply them in this context, two things happen. One is that you know, the, the outcome disparity would not actually control for anything. So it would be a crude racial difference, which I argue in some cases, you know, you could actually um, underestimate disparity if you don't account for these, you know, for these age differences. Um, and then, you know, to get to those elegant forms, you would actually have to condition the intervention on, 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 on everything, including SES, you know, which I, what I just said before is, is not really something we, we would want to do because that doesn't really reflect medical ethics. You know, we shouldn't be going to the doctor 
and you know, make treatment decisions based on one's socioeconomic status. Um, so essentially, you know, when we think about you know, doing um, EHR or cohort studies or whatever sort of study to identify what's contributing to disparities and what should be targets for um, you know, policies and interventions to reduce disparities, we can actually use causal inference to do this, but you know, hopefully I've convinced you that we have to be careful about what are our value judgments you know, and, 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 and how do those affect how we define disparity in outcomes and also um, in, 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 in the targets that our interventions might affect. Um, and, so in, 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 and when we think about our analyses in this way, it may not lead to, it may not always lead to off the shelf estimators that are um, really popular in the literature. Um, the ones that I present in my paper are actually adaptable so that you can make whatever value judgments you want. Um, and sometimes they reduce to the, to the standard estimators and um, sometimes they don't, but it really depends on the value judgment. Um, and so uh, last to uh, close up, you know, um, allowability has, you know, implica um, implications for, des for design in that if there are covariates that we think are uh, useful for defining disparity, we want to make sure that we actually measure those in our study. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do here. Um, you know, I'm really going to be working on practical examples and some demonstration papers, um, you know, and as, 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 as well as, you know, mapping this out for more complicated analyses. Uh, so that's um, um, what I have to share with you today. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a couple minutes um, to answer questions. And thank you so much for um, uh, being with me during this talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. That was really, really a terrific uh, talk. Um, I will open up to questions. Uh, Kaberi. Yeah, that was a that was a great talk, and I'm, uh, I have to confess, thoroughly confused. <laughs> in sorry. Some respects, and that's not your fault at all. It's probably me. Um, I'm just trying to um, wrap my mind around just the concept of allowable versus non-allowable, and disparity versus inequity. Because it seems to me a lot of, like, you know, you've got, there's, there's race and ethnocultural background, there's gender, there's socioeconomic status. Any of those factors could influence, let's say, treatment intensification for biased reasons. You know, they're not supposed to, but they right. could. And so... You know, how, like now you you completely convinced me that there might be an error in looking at each of the variables separately because then you you lose the the combined effect. I think if I'm understanding correctly, but at the same time, if you allow, I mean, I think you understand my confusion more than I do. So you can go ahead. And, uh, yeah, um, I think so. Like one way I think about it, in just a simple case is um, like if you know, I think of a disparity as something that's telling us something is wrong. Right. Um, and so, like, you know, if we're thinking about looking at a healthcare system and I see like a crude difference in treatment intensification rates, I can't really go to the leader of the healthcare system and say, look, we've got a problem, mm -hmm. you know, because he might, he or she might say, well, you know, do these people need this treatment? Right. So let's okay. actually look to see if they need the treatment. And so, Right. That's really what I'm arguing is that, you know, okay. the disparity should really point to unfairness, um, you know, um, and so that means that you have to, to account for factors um, that really should be driving treatment decisions. And so the question of what should be driving treatment decisions is really, you know, um, a subjective one, um, you know, and that's why what you define as allowability is a choice. Uh, so, you know, I argue that, you know, we really should think about ideal social contracts for thinking about, you know, what should some good that's distributed, you know, you know, what should be allowable for that or not, right? And so in, in the clinical example, I think, you know, clinical factors um, make sense, demographic factors make sense because in many cases they're, they're clinical factors too, but SES for me is one where I draw a hard line. Um, when you get to health outcomes, what's allowable is, is, is a little fuzzier. I mean, there are some people who say, you know, everything's impacted by histor historical disadvantage, yeah. structural racism. But I think that that kind of, um, it sounds nice, but I think in, 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 
in, in, in, in, in, in practical matters, it means that you may miss some things, right? Mm -hmm. So if we looked at the open safely study and said, we're just going to look at the crude ethnic difference in mortality, we wouldn't have seen a racial, you know, we wouldn't have seen in, 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 in ethnic difference. And the reason is, is because that uh, is that the ethnic minority groups were actually not disadvantaged on age. And age is what was predicting worse outcomes, right? So you're essentially would be comparing mostly younger ethnic minorities to older ethnic majorities. Mm -hmm. And it's not really, you know, um, you're not really able to see uh, the excess rates because they're being masked by that age distribution, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, that's a case where I think that, yes, you know, like, you know, maybe you want to be conservative about, about what you adjust for, but I think when you're in a case where you have something that's amenable to inter intervention and um, the, the, the marginalized group is actually advantaged on that factor, you might want to, you know, actually, you might want to adjust for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, those are like really kind of, you know, the things, but I think how you think about disparities in health outcomes, you know, I think about manip manipulability and amenability to intervention, and, 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 and whether or not the marginalized groups are disadvantaged on those factors. And then when I have like some sort of good that's distributed in society, say treatment, you know, I wanna think about what's a fair sort of allocation rule, you know, that, you know, I might believe is fair and then, you know, condition the disparity on, 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 on those factors and those factors alone. Um, and so when you do your causal inference, there may be other variables like socioeconomic status that come along that you know you wouldn't define disparities for outcomes or you know treatment by, but you still have to incorporate it in your analysis somehow. And what I'm showing in this talk is that you can actually incorporate socioeconomic status into the analysis without you know quote unquote over adjusting the disparity measure. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, well, I just want to thank you again because I, I think, you know, uh, oh, there is another question. Sure. Uh, Clara Bolster Foucault. Sorry to sneak in at the end here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for this wonderful talk. This is a lot to digest. Um, I have maybe a question that's a little bit out of scope in terms of what you talked about today, but I was wondering if you could speak briefly to uh, how these um, types of decompositions that you're talking about now map to questions about intersectionality. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, this is beyond the scope of this talk, but um, so I think of this as directly applicable. Um, you know, in, in other work of mine, there's a paper I have in social psychiatry and psychiatric epidemiology where I think about... Um, the notion of, of a joint disparity. Um, and so I think about, you know, people who are at the nexus of say, um, you know, um, who have membership in, you know, uh, marginalized, you know, groups along multiple axes. So you could think about uh, racial ethnic minority women um, who may be queer, and then you sort of contrast that to people who are in none of those groups, right? And so that could, you know, that's a disparity measure that would show you the full um, excess risk that is, you know, a, a, along those joint axes. And then you can shift the distribution from that, you know, multiply um, marginalized group, you know, um, you can shift the treatment of distribution from there to the multiply privileged group and, and ask how that joint disparity measure can change. Um, you can think of other disparity measures where you sort of you might look at say race within levels of socioeconomic status and, 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 and you can carry out these decompositions that way too. But everything I presented here could be applied to um, multi-axis disparity measures. Um, you know, I, it's, 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 it's totally extensible. Um, you know, and a lot of the comments that I made there um, are, 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 you know, in this single axis case apply to those two. I also have a paper in, Social um, in social science and medicine, that um, it's a commentary that that sort of talks about the application of um, you know this sort of analysis in that setting. Okay, great, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I see we're, we're already at five ten. I will have many questions. I guess one one thing I put out, uh, Dr. Jackson, is. Are you looking for collaborators? Um, I'm sure yeah. many of us <laughs> who work in the field, you know. This is what we do every day. We, you know, we, especially when we're using observational data, and we try to make causal inferences. 
Um, and I don't think we're in the habit of reflecting on things like ethics or social contracts or these value statements um, when we're choosing what to adjust for, you know, and, and so much of our work ends up in, you know, these models that adjust for usually confounders. And then we're trying to, we think that, you know, our, our main uh, parameter of interest is causing the outcome of interest. Um, but there's a lot, a lot to digest and reflect on. And, and I think more and more we're realizing that studying disparities really takes truly an, an expertise also in the study of, of disparities and how to formulate it in order to really address it. Um, I have a lot of questions. I mean, one of the questions that's burning in my mind is that um, how to, um, uh, when you're dealing with non-allowables, um, you know, I think if, if you show, for example, there's a population that has a, a disadvantaged population um, in, in many facets, socioeconomic, historically, uh, perhaps geographically living in a remote, remote area, and a, a disparity is clearly demonstrated. Um, clinicians were often interested, okay, what can we do clinically differently to address yeah. the disparity versus, you know, what needs to be continuously done societally which is, you know, of course, you know, address social inequities. But at the end of the day, how do we, you know, do, how can we signal, how can we identify whether our clinical judgments and our clinical interventions are also contributing to the disparity? So I'm not, you know, it's probably like a complicated question to answer, but. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I think, I mean, I think to me, the challenge is, I mean, so I think that, you know, in an ideal world, we can apply these tools to almost any question. Um, I think the challenge is, is measuring the decisions themselves. Um, so measuring treatment decisions is not entirely easy. I'm actually working on this right now. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, nuance that goes in there. Um, and there's a lot of factors about the, so, so, so to me, this is an argument for, for one, for better data. You know, if we're going to really be doing or, or striving towards learning healthcare systems. Um, you know, we have very little data about, say, patient clinician interactions, right? Um, do we have measures of patient activation? Um, you know, how well patients are able to, um, you know, manage, self manage their conditions and also navigate the healthcare system and, and, and interact with providers. You know, do we have measures of provider um, provider factors? You know, uh, you know, um, you know. There's a lot of like variables that I think we could analyze to sort of see what's driving these factors. Um, you know, uh, so to me, it, you know, it, ideally, um, the perfect you know study would be where we you know have a healthcare system where we're really willing to go in and actually measure some of these things. And, you know, you could do it in an observational study, you could do it in say a trial, a crossover trial or, or something, but like something to go and actually measure these factors. And then, you know, we could start to see analytically, empirically, what actually is contributing to the disparity. I mean, right now, I think the best that you could do, uh, which is also a really useful approach is, you know, you can identify really crude growth targets, like say treatment intensification, and then you can do a qualitative study to really unpack uh, you know, what are those sort of uh, contextual um, and process oriented um, um, phenomena that are happening to sort of lead to inequitable outcomes. And I think that should always be done. Um, but I think, you know, when you have hard data, you can marry the two and, and have like a really in, informative study. Um, and, and to answer your first question, I'm, I'm always, you know, looking for, for good data, for examples. Um, I am swamped right now. So I will say that, but, you know, always reach out, you know, if you have a question or, you know, idea for collaboration, I can't always say yes, but, you know, it, 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 it you know, you know, it's, it's always worth reaching out and, and something that I've, I've really committed myself is, you know, I, I really am doing this work so I can help people um, who are really committed to achieving health equity. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, I really do it. I'm doing this work to help people who are, you know, really serious about, you know, working towards intervention. So if that's you, you know, always feel, 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 feel free to uh, email me and, and I'll do my, my, do my best within 
my capability to 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 help. 